you know, always think about pre-renal, renal, and post-renal, you know? Um, and always know your patient population, where you work at. Uh, if, you work, if you work in my setting uh, versus if you work uh, outpatient or if you um, work in urgent care or primary care, the way you deal with things is different, you know? Um, so I'm trying to think of a setting where you would have Renal, mostly, uh, let's talk about post-renal. Post-renal, we see this, this, you see a lot in the surgery side. So if you work in surgery, you have a lot of patients with post-renal uh, acute kidney injury because uh, patients that have like BPH and then they get like, uh, patients that have uh, BPH and then they end up getting some narcotics, some sedation, uh, makes the, um, uh, the bladder lazy, and with the obstruction of the prostate, they end up with, um, Post, post renal because it starts the uh, it starts backing up into the kidneys. So if you work in the ER, uh, you know, and a patient comes and says, "Hey, um, you know," they always come and say, "Oh, I have abdominal pain." You always have like this 85 year old um, mild dementia patient that kind of know what's going on but kind of not. Uh, so this is where you get to pay pay the big bucks. You get paid the big bucks to figure it out, right? So a patient is never going to say, hey, you know what? I have post-renal acute kidney injury. You know, that'd be great. You know, they'll come and say, oh, you know, uh, this patient is getting rehab for hip. They were there. They started complaining of lower abdominal pain, and they went to the restroom maybe one time. You know, next thing you better be doing is palpating their uh, super pubic, area, uh, pubic region area. And uh, you push it, and the patient jumps out of the bed. Ah, you know, I'm in a lot of pain. Then you straight cap them and they release 1,000 a a cc's or 1,500 uh, cc's. You know, this is what, you know, you got to start thinking about when you see patients. And then you have renal, mostly, in my setting when we have renal, it likely like vancomycin, you know, it causes renal failure or other medications. What we see a ton of is pre-renal acute kidney injury uh, for reasons like this. So. Uh, you already have uh, decreased volume coming into the kidneys, and then the volume is being leaked out because the liver is not producing albumin. So this is a perfect environment for the kidney not to get any blood. So you got to think about the kidney as like an organ this big, like, and it takes up uh, two of them, and it takes up 25% of all your blood, right? And it circulates, it filters your blood however many times they told you in physiology. So the kidney is like, hey, what's going on, you know? Like, why am I not getting enough uh, volume to filter enough? So then the kidney uh, starts, uh, kicks in the renin-angiotensin system. So it starts uh, uh, retaining, it starts uh, making more ADH, you know, or being more sensitive to ADH, antidiuretic hormone, holding on to more water, holding on to more salt uh, through the mineral, mineral corticoids. Um, uh, so then you have patient, patient with cirrhosis, uh, they already have enough volume, you don't want more volume. So they start holding on to the volume where they get bigger ascites, you know, because it's still the same problem. You don't have the blood returning to circulation. And now you have it leaking out into the lower extremities, uh, and you have edema. Um, and then this leads to a point where, uh, to another point, uh, where it, may, it can make the renal disease uh, worse because now the patient, now you want to give the patient symptomatic relief because of their edema and their ascites, and they're all oh, my stomach hurts and my feet are so I can't even walk, they're so sort of swollen and they hurt, and now you give them diuretics, you know, uh, and and the patient already has anorexia and nausea and vomiting because the fluid in their stomach is pushing up into their stomach, excuse me, the fluid in the peritoneal cavity is pushing up to their stomach, which makes them not hungry, it makes them nauseous, and they're not eating, and on top of that, you're giving them diuretics, so now that lead even leads more to, that can lead even more to a pre-renal acute injury, acute kidney injury. And then keep in mind as well, patients with, we talked about variceal uh, bleeds, because the blood is backing up, uh, and then they end up with a bleed. So now you have a bleed, you're on diuretics, uh, and this patient's not eating enough. Um, 
And then on top of that, you know, just from the cirrhosis, they're not getting enough volume to the kidney. It makes a perfect combination to kill the kidney, right? So there's two types of uh, hepatorenal syndromes. I won't go into them. You, if you're really interested, you can uh, look into them. You know, type 1, type 2. Type 1 is like, it, usually patients recover faster. Type 2 is kind of a more chronic deal. So it's not uncommon to have cirrhotic patients with renal failure, you know, which makes it a big mess. Like clinically, patients like that are very complicated because uh, then everything you have to, everything you do uh, has to, you know, you have to worry about the kidneys. Having good kidneys in my setting is, every time I have a patient with good kidneys, I'm so excited, you know, <laughs> so excited because then I can do whatever I want. I can do medications, I can do diuretics, I can do... You know, just a, I can run tests because a lot of the tests are, you know, a lot of those um, things that we look are excreted in the kidneys. So if you have bad kidneys, like for example, uh, troponin is mostly licked in the cre uh, excreted in the kidneys. So if you have bad kidneys and you get a troponin on a patient that has some mild coronary artery disease, uh, the troponin is going to be high. So then, you know, the significance of that if you don't have a baseline lab uh, can be challenging. And now you, you know, got yourself in trouble because. What do you do? Um, so always keep in mind baseline labs. Uh, you know, you want to have, if you have baseline labs, that's really good uh, or re really helpful. Uh, labs are usually uh, just one piece to the puzzle. Uh, it's not the end all be all. They're really helpful when they're really low or really high. You know, but typically what we want to see is a trend. You know, what is, don't ever, don't ever call if you work in the ER, call the uh, hospitalist and say, hey, this patient's uh, creatinine is 1.5. And it's like, okay, so what? This, so what? Like, you know, we have tons of patients with chronic kidney disease. Their baseline creatinine might be 1.5. What was there? Now, more significant is if you call and say, hey, this patient's creatinine is 1.5. Uh, last month, it was uh, 0.8. Now you're proving a point, right? Okay. Uh, and then let's talk about uh, how, moving on, let's talk about how the liver, uh, you know, it, it plays a big role in detoxification of drugs. Uh, so if you have cirrhosis and the hepatocytes, like we talked about, are dead, they can't, like, they can't process uh, some uh, drug. The cytochrome, uh, uh, the CYP450 can, you know, deoxidize uh, those uh, foreign toxic drugs. And then we talked already about some, we talked some about the scarring and the uh, portal that leads to portal hypertension uh, that can lead to many complications. You can almost half or even more of the complications you get from cirrhosis are from, if you can get this portal hypertension idea or the concept down, it'll really make a lot of sense in why you get esophageal varices, why you get renal failure. Um, why you get splenomegaly, and then that leads to thrombocytopenia. So the portal hypertension is a very important point to why you get a lot of the symptoms. Um, when I, were, I was a student, I was just like memorizing, like, oh, you know, you get splenomegaly, but I never really tried to understand why, you know? So that's what happens, you just memorize, because the body has a physi physiology, it's not gonna change, you know? So if you understand the physiology, some basic biochemistry, then everything else will start making sense instead of just memorizing and then walking out of the room not knowing, right? Like, but if you remember the concept, oh, you know, the liver, that the cells die off, this causes scarring, this causes the stellar cells to produce albumin, and it pushes on the sinusoid, which backs it, now, now it compresses it, now it backs up into the hepatic and the portal vein, and now blood can't get through it, it starts backing up in the spleen, now you have splenomegaly, now this also starts backing up in the stomach vein, and then you get esophageal varices, and then, uh, it starts backing up so much that it starts leaking out the fluid in the peritoneal cavity, which uh, reduces the volume to the kidneys, which this is a kidney injury, right? Mm -hmm. So that makes a lot more sense than just saying, this patient has ascites, or this patient has, you know, whatever. Uh, so if you get to work and you'll probably do a, I, whenever I was in my general surgery rotation, I never got to see this. You see a lot of, you'll do a lot of lab coles, like 10 a day. You might get to do a colon resection. Uh, you're only there a month, so you probably see like less than 1% of whatever they see. Um, so uh, they, you can see the, the regenerative nodules or the nodules. So on this picture, 
this is probably you know to the point of uh, of course cirrhosis it says but uh, if it was fatty liver it'd probably be like uh, edematous and yellow you know um, at this point it's too late uh, and then here we like we said you know cirrhosis is one of those things that you might find an in incidental finding maybe if the patient comes in one day and they're going to have surgery and you know, they, you happen to have fine, uh, order a PTI-NR and the INR is high, and then, you know, you, they're not on a blood on warfarin. By the way, don't ever call, if, you, if a patient is on a liquid and you're in the ER, never call a hospitalist and say, this patient's on a liquid, their INR is this, because it, it doesn't really matter, you know. It could affect the INR, but what we use INR is for uh, warfarin. So, you know, this patient's not a warfarin, they might not have surgery. Uh, you end up doing, uh, sending them to the PCP and they end up working, working them up and they have cirrhosis. And symptom, the point is that they don't have symptoms until late. Like remember that first slide that said the symptoms come on about whenever the uh, liver is about 10%. Uh, that's pretty remarkable, you know that, that your liver can work up until 10% of the cells are there. Uh, so once again they have fatigue and weakness. Uh, this is likely secondary from, you know, because we talked about the splenomegaly, right? How it's signaling to the bone marrow, hey, don't produce more um, blood products. So they have anemia, you know? Patients with anemia have fatigue and weakness. You know, on top of that, they have inflammation, they likely have inflammation in their liver from hepatitis C or from fatty liver, you know? Um, they have anorexia and weight loss, you know? Uh, the ascites pushing on the stomach, uh, making them not hungry or, uh, they have the jaundice, and we already talked about the bilirubin, how that can uh, accumulate once you can't process enough uh, bilirubin uh, that can be leaked out, or, it, or if you, the cell dies, it leaks out the conjugated bilirubin. Uh, if you can't process the bilirubin, the conjugated bilirubin, and that can leak out, and that, and that, is stored, that gets stored in the, in the eyes, in the skin. Um, absent irregular menses and chronic anabulation, uh, the uh, the liver plays a big role in uh, inactivating estrogen. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the, uh, you know, men menstrual cycle where estrogen spikes and progesterone spikes and uh, whatever hormone. So this likely has to do with how estrogen constantly is staying high. So people are like having like menopausal symptoms, right? Um, the levito, that has to do also with the estrogen in men, you know? They have elevated estrogen constantly. Um, and the tea colored urine and clay uh, colored stool, uh, because the clay colored stool, remember, you have to convert unconjugated to conjugated, and it goes and uh, is converted into urobilinogen in the gut. And, uh, and then that is converted to stercobilin, which the stercobilin is the one that gives the color to the stool. So you're, you're not conjugating. Once you get to, to a certain point in cirrhosis where you don't have hepatocytes, to conjugate the bilirubin, then you, you know that's that's likely where the clay color stool is coming from. And then we talked about the edema and the abdominal bloating, uh, the edema in the lower extremities from uh, the kidneys retaining uh, ADH and uh, and uh, retaining water and salt because they have uh, they're not getting uh, they're not getting enough perfusion, so they kick in the angiorenic tendon uh, system. Um, and the abdominal bloating from th that leads to uh, the ascites that plays a big component on why they just get renal failure because uh, the blood can't get back into circulation because it's, it can't get through the liver, you know. Um, and therefore, the pressure in the portal vein is so high it, it leaks out into the peritoneal cavity, causing ascites. Um, this is probably one of the biggest complaints I have from patients. Uh, I have abdominal pain. My belly is so distended, my belly hurts, you know, and typically, you know, these patients are already uh, immunocompromised. A lot of them have uh, leukopenia and, you know, uh, they have ascites and it, sometimes that can lead to spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, which is another complication because that's fluid in the peritoneal cavity that sits there and your gut is full of bacteria, so it can just like go into that fluid and grow. Uh, so sometimes clinically, if you're in the ER, uh, you know, sometimes you might run more tests than necessary just because they have so much ascites because you haven't seen them before. So if, you know, for some reason this patient decided to go 
you can type of fried chicken and you know was drinking a lot more water because they were thirsty and now they're holding a lot more sodium. Their ascites might be significantly bigger from a previous day. So you don't know what it looked like a couple of days ago, but they come in and they say, I have abdominal pain, which could be just from the ascites, but you end up getting CT scans, et cetera, et cetera, because nowadays we practice defensive medicine, right? We don't want to miss anything. And and it it, it ended just being ascites that's causing that patient's abdominal pain. So that's probably the top complaint I get from cirrhotic patients because the ascites. And uh, we also have easy bruising and bleeding. The easy bruising likely from the low production of uh, clotting factors from the uh, from the liver. And on top of that, you have thrombocytopenia, so this patient's uh, clotting is uh, impaired. Um, and uh, night blindness uh, likely from patient malabsorption of those uh, fatty uh, vitamins. Um, this patient's uh, that that also leads uh, the. Um, the malabsorption problem leads to a lot of uh, and uh, uh, leads to a lot of weakness and weight loss because they, even though they might be having a good diet, their gut is just not absorbing it. You know, um, and then we can have you know blood in the stool or blood in the vomit from variceal bleeding. Um, so here we have a picture of uh, the jaundice in uh, this patient. And the scleroecterus. So uh, on physical exam, this is things that you know uh, you might want to be looking for. Uh, oh, you know, this patient, I, if you, this patient has a lot of vague symptoms, and it comes to prove a point that not all patients are malingers. You know, not all pa some patients might be truly sick with a severe disease, and we just don't know it because they're, you know, they might. You know, they might not have symptoms until later on, but if you have a patient, you know, if you're in a primary care setting and a patient comes in and says, oh, you know, man, I have nausea, vomiting, and uh, I'm not hungry, and my belly hurts, and I have swelling in my legs, you might just be like, man, this patient is just too much. Like, there's really nothing wrong with them, maybe, I don't know. Like, that's just, you know, it, it comes, like, you got to be thinking, oh, man, like, you know, could this patient have cirrhosis because their symptoms are so vague, you know? And the liver affects almost every uh, organ in the system, every organ in your body. So and there are patients that have 20 different chief complaints, per se, that are actually sick. You know, they might not have fibromyalgia. You know? So you 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 might you know start working whenever you see patients on your differential. You know, a differential, thinking about on top what most common. You know, that's why it's important to know the patient population and know. Uh, you know, the type of patient you see, you know, for example, if you work in an HIV clinic, you know, or a clinic that sees a lot of HIV patients, if somebody comes out with a pneumonia, uh, you might be thinking pneumocystis carina, you know, for this patient, because this is the patient population you see, but if you see them in a primary care setting, likely you get, you know, younger patients or et cetera, you might just be thinking this might be a strep pneumonia, you know, so it's important to know where you work and the patient population you see. Um, and and it also that's like important. I always like when when you present a patient, there's a there's room for there's always room for presentation, and you're always going to have to present patients. So you work on it. You know the age, uh, the race, um, and the age, race, and gender. Usually, you usually say those things because um, patients with different ages, ranges, or sex present with different you know, common things. So when you say, hey, this patient is a 75-year-old uh, white female, you already, uh, a 75-year-old white male with chest pain, you know, you're already thinking maybe uh, uh, coronary artery disease. Where if you say, this is a 20-year-old male with uh, chest pain, less common causes of chest pain may be like a PE or something. You know, like the likelihood that they're gonna have coronary artery disease is less likely, you know? That comes up to another point, uh, you know, always listen to your gut, you know. We had one time a patient who had, she was like a 33-year-old female, um, and she kept having troponins that were spiking, you know, like one, five, one, three, five, you know, we call cardiologists, cardiologists is like, you know, this patient, there's no way she's having a heart attack. She's 33-year-old, she's Asian, she's not obese, doesn't have any signs of metabolic syndrome. 
like, whatever. So we kept doing Hirsch report and turned it up to 13. Well, this is likely not a common cause. You don't have to go in every 33-year-old female that has the troponin, you know. But the patient didn't have a thrombus in one of her coronary arteries is causing an MI. So just not not just keep in mind that not only coronary heart disease can cause uh, MI or or the most common. That's why you got to know the most common causes of a disease process. Mm -hmm. But there are unusual things that cause that disease process. Uh, so we have spider angiomas from the elevated estrogen that we talked about the liver not uh, deactivating the pulmonary edema as well from the elevated estrogen. The jaundice we talked about the bilirubin. Uh, ecchymosis from the uh, lower platelet and clotting factors. Um, I can't even say that word, so I'm not even going to try to say it. Helenkesia. Uh, and then uh, the caput medusa has those uh, dilated veins in the abdomen. Just, uh, it's a, if you see that, that's probably because their cirrhosis is so bad uh, that the, you know, the portal hypertension, they, they're probably portal hypertension dominant that is um, diverting that blood to other blood, like they can have hemorrhoids, right? Because they're diverting that blood to um, the anal vein, veins, the hemorrhoids, or capi medusa to the veins in the abdomen. And then splenomegaly, we talked about why you have splenomegaly that's backing up of the blood flow, the icterus, and uh, the ascites from the uh, fluid building up in the peritoneal cavity, the gynecomastia in men from the elevated estrogen, and nobody really knows about the, why the pituitary contractures happen, uh, even in healthy patients, right? Uh, there's ideas why, but uh, the point is that when you walk in, in into a room, you can get a lot of information just by looking at the patient, you know? Um, early on in my career, uh, I walked into a room and clearly, now if I would have walked in that room, I would have known, but a patient was clearly demented, you know? They were just... They don't really acknowledge you. They're just kind of sitting there, they're hectic. And I go and try to shake this patient's hand. Well, this patient's severely demented, it's not shaking my hand. Maybe I want to make me look like an idiot in front of the family, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, before you go up to a patient and shake their hand, probably start talking as soon as you walk in the door, you know? You can already get some information just by the way they respond to you, the way they, you know, if you say, hi, how you doing? And they're talking about their farm, my farm, and, you know, there's probably something that's going on. You um, so definitely, or somebody that's cachectic, doesn't have any teeth, um, I was going to say they're from Southeast Oklahoma, but I don't think anybody. Because <laughs> I have a friend who's a PA that's from Southeast Oklahoma, he gets so mad when they say that. Um, you know, uh, you, uh, you can already maybe tell they're on meth, you know, or drug users, and therefore they might be IV drug users that can maybe cause them to have hepatitis C, which maybe that's what causes their cirrhosis, right? So just by looking at a patient, you know, that's why you can't really treat a patient, that's why a physical exam is so important, you can't really treat a patient without seeing the patient, you know? Uh, even if I describe to you, if it, even if I describe to you the patient to the T, you know, this patient has two plus edema, they have uh, four centimeters of uh, jugular vein distension, and you know, you, there's so much information that they can be of changes by looking at the patient. So we have a picture of ascites, you know. The other day I actually just got to win my first uh, paracentesis at bedside. Uh, one of my attendings got to do it, so I don't know if I ever want to do it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of procedures, you know, I just like to be all brains. I'll let the peasants do the work. <laughs> <laughs> I got that from my last attendant. He's like, why should I touch anything? Like. I just have my peasants. If I need a knee, I'll just call the orthopedic oh. surgeon to come. <laughs> if I need, you know, a cat, I'll just have the cardiologist. All I have to do is think about it. Why? It made me feel really good about it. I was like, man, I'm the brains behind the operation. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we have, we talked about how shunting of the blood flow because of the portal vein hypertension. Uh, this is just... I don't know. I mean, I've never. There, like I said, I guess if you think about it, they have severe. If you see this, and then you're thinking immediately, they have severe portal hypertension, you know, um, which can lead to other problems. But um, I think I've seen this like one time. That probably the hepatologist sees it a lot. Uh, clubbing. The, you know, the clubbing of the fingernails. Uh, this. 
this again going on about the physical exam. If you see, this is just nobody really knows why you get clubbing on the fingernails. There's like some ideas, maybe because of vasodilation of the fingers, etc. But just to prove the point, if you walk in and you shake the patient's hand and you see clubbing of the fingernails, you gotta, in your mind, you gotta be thinking, hey, this patient has a chronic disease. You know, either they have eczema or cirrhosis. You know, it's like so you you gotta start building up questions because the patient, you have, you ask patients, hey. Any past medical history? No, I'm okay. But then you ask them, hey, who's your primary care? Well, you see any other types of specialists, and they end up seeing 10 different types of specialists. So how you, act, how you ask the questions, what information you get from patients, that's what makes you a good clinician. You know, patients are just going to say, I don't know. How, what medication do you take? I take a handful. You know, I don't know what they are, but if you approach it another way, hey, uh, you see a cardiologist, what is he treating, you know? Oh, I had a stent in my heart, I had a major heart attack, or, or I see, uh, you know, a kidney doctor. Uh, oh, has he ever told you what stage your kidney is in? Oh, it's stage four. Oh, there you go, there you have some information, versus patient's never going to tell you. So don't ever hesitate to ask patients, like, has, have they ever told you what stage your kidney is in? Have, whenever you see an elevated creatinine and and you don't have a baseline, don't ever hesitate to ask, has anybody told you you're, you have an elevated creatinine? Usually patients are like, oh yeah, by the way, I see a nephrologist eat in my, oh, you know what your baseline creatinine is. Like, that doesn't make you seem incompetent, that actually makes you very competent, because you're good at histor uh, you're usually good at getting history, right? Um, I used to be like, man, I should know these things, you know, but you don't, you don't know until you ask. And patients typically know, especially if they have unusual things, they have had a long, stormy workup. Like um, the other day, I had a quadriplegic. Like you know, it's easy to assume maybe he was born that way. But I just asked him, "Hey, uh, why do you have? Why are you quadriplegic?" Oh, by the way, I had a diving accident. Mm -hmm. You know, I broke my neck. Like you know, don't ever assume. Just ask. If they don't know, they don't know. Have you ever been told you have a murmur? Oh yeah, I had a murmur and I have a mechanical valve. You know, that's something that could have been missed because this patient needs to be on anticoagulation if they have a me mechanical valve uh, that, you know, you could have missed it and now they end up with, they end up dying or something. And then, uh, so, you know, that's the point about the club and fingernails, the edema, we talked about how, you know, the renin angiotensin system holding in the water and the salt leaking into the um, low extremities. The axterexis, this is probably something I should check more, but, uh, so what happens is patients, and then uh, you, uh, any, every person after they eat, uh, the diet, uh, the food or whatever, makes it down to the large intestine and then bacteria convert protein into ammonia, so you, know, you guys can look into that. So uh, that, the ammonia is transported to the liver and it's uh, you know, made into a less, uh, it's processed. Well, what patients don't have hepatocytes because you know, they have fatty liver, alcohol, disease, etc. They don't have hepatocytes to activate this or transform this uh, ammonia to ammonium or whatever it is. So it starts building up in their system. You know, and patients get confused. It, it, their ammonia level can be so high that they can die. Patients can die from, um, you know, hepatic encephalopathy. It can lead to a coma and death. Uh, so it, you know, um, you know, I used to be like, what's the big deal? With, you know, like, why is everybody on lactose? What's the big deal? You know, but then I was like. You can really die from a hepatic encephalopathy. That's a big deal, you know. So, uh, patients be, you know, we treat it with lactulose, uh, give them some lactulose, let them uh, get rid of some of the ammonia through the bowel, and then if it's really bad, you can give them some cefaxin, the antibiotic to kill some of that bacteria in the gut. And then the mental status change. This is another com very common uh, reason why we admit patients for hepatic encephalopathy, and it's easy, easily be treatable, you know. And uh, the challenge is when they become so confused, they can't swallow, right? So are you going to give them the, uh, the lactulose through the mouth? Now you're going to have a patient aspirate and now have an aspiration pneumonia. So uh, this is like stuff you got to keep in your mind, right? Or like, for example, if a 80-year-old uh, demented patient comes in with the right lower low pneumonia, immediately you should start thinking, hey, is this an aspiration pneumonia? You know, because they're demented. Um, could they be having swallowing problems and the way it's presenting on a low, right lower lung pneumonia? Because typically, uh, you know, when you aspirate something, it goes to the right lower low because of the right main bronchus, right? So, 
uh, a lot, and, then, and then so we have, um, so the, what I was going through is that sometimes you can give them life dose through the mouth, so you can do an enema. You can do any medication enema, right? If the patient can't, if they need it, you can do aspirin, you can do whatever enema. Just talk to your pharmacist. That's another thing about working in the hospital. I pick up the phone and I call my pharmacist, hey, um, can you help me dose this medication or can we do it this way or can we do it? And you know, this pharmacists are PharmDs, you know, they, uh, excuse me, they're clinical pharmacists. Uh, they want to be involved in patient care. You know, they get excited to be involved in patient care. They don't want to be pill counters. If they wanted to be pill counters, they'll be at CVS. So don't ever hesitate to call your pharmacist and be, hey, I have a question about this dosing or can we do this uh, topical or enema or, or you can contact them uh, renal clearance for the medicine or renal dosing of antibiotics. Um, you know, get them involved. Uh, muscle wasting likely from malabsorption and not being hungry. Um, the breath of the dead, that, that's just like some incidental finding you have when it's really bad and uh, some of that blood is being not, some of that is not, is being diverted to the lungs and it gives it a like, because the molecules in the, in the blood is not being, uh, you know, processed. Some of those chemicals stay active and you can smell it. It's just like a little fun fact if you ever in trivia. But, or like I said, sometimes you think it's just irrelevant until you have a patient like that and they might have hepatic encephalopathy, they might not give you any, uh, this happens a lot, they're confused, there's no family at bedside, you can't get any history. You might come up to them and smell it and then you might be like, oh, this patient might have really bad cirrhosis. Maybe, maybe their confusion is from uh, the hepatic encephalopathy. Let me try an enema, you know. So this is so it makes you a good clinician, you know. Here we go. The definitely, if you see somebody with clubbing, you know, yeah, try to find a reason why. Usually, a chronic disease, most commonly seen with uh, emphysema. Uh, you know, we talked about differential diagnosis. I've always having a differential diagnosis. Make sure try to have like a, you know. So uh, and always try to have like at least five. You know, when, like once you start knowing your patient population, you'll have you in your mind unknowingly build up a differential anyways. But if you think about it, think about something unusual. You know, your last your last number five. Your number five. Think about could it be something really unusual? You know. Uh, uh, and then, so these are some some differentials. And then labs, um, you know, initially the AST, ALT would be elevated, more, more likely uh, this will be elevated in the uh, hepatitis stage, like the alcoholic hepatitis uh, or viral hepatitis. Once you have no hepatocytes to leak this out, they probably won't be elevated. Uh, you know, AST, the ALT ratio, greater than one, uh, with alcohol is like greater than two. Uh, outfalls, uh, GGT, I've never actually ordered this this lab, I don't know, I guess if you have somebody that's really confused or something and then you can't, but I mean usually patients will tell you they have, they're alcoholic, so I don't see it's significant or, um, Elevated bilirubin, um, the higher the bilirubin in any patient is, uh, the higher the mortality is, so you'll see, clinic, uh, you'll see people freak out, oh this patient's bilirubin is three, Okay, what's the big deal? You know, well, uh, because of, uh, you know we know that the higher the bilirubin, the higher the mortality. So even if you have like, uh, and then also when you differential, if somebody has an elevated bilirubin, like, can you have other serious causes like uh, pancreatic mass that's obstructing? So anytime if you work in the ER and you patient comes in randomly and they have an elevated bilirubin, like keep that in the back of your mind. And then anemia, we. Uh, we talked about the splenomegaly, the decreased platelet count, um, the low albumin from low production, um, increased fatty acids um, uh, that we talked about with the fatty acid, and it, which leads to low cholesterol production because it's more busy making out uh, uh, cholesterol. So if you have a patient with a metabolic syndrome with a three out of five obesity, hypertension, diabetes, uh, hyper uh, Hyper, uh, hyper uh, triglyceridemia, 
is uh, more important because if you have a patient that is obese, if they may have metabolic syndrome, uh, and their AST, AOT is high, and then they're, they have high triglycerides, uh, you might be thinking this patient has already fatty liver, you know? So, um, and another thing in diabetics, you will never be able to control the triglycerides until the blood sugar gets under control. So don't, you know, before you start them on medication for triglycerides. And then the prolonged PT, INR, leukopenia from um, uh, bone marrow suppression. Uh, and then we, you can uh, screen patients. Once you uh, know, sometimes when you get cirrhosis, if you want to know why, you can, um, or you might screen a patient for hepatitis because they're IV drug users. Um, and, um, or if they have cirrhosis, you might want to screen them for the hepatitis to see if that's what caused their, uh, their cirrhosis. And then the ammonia. Another important point of the ammonia is uh, what's their baseline? You know, a patients can have an ammonia of 60, 70, and still be okay. You know, but that's what they, their body has compensated for that. Their ammonia typically runs there. So, uh, if a patient has a high ammonia and they're not confused, don't be surprised. Or don't just use the ammonia to treat the patient. You know, don't treat the lab, treat the patient. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, and these are for other, uh, for rare causes of cirrhosis. If the patient has hemochromatosis or uh, Wilson's disease, uh, like I said, usually these patients, uh, they have had already a long workup, and you're, you're likely, unless you work in one, I don't know, one of those specialties, rheumatology or something, um, that you end up making the diagnosis after you've had all the lab works possible in the world. Uh, the you know that imaging is can be used as well to screen for fatty liver, or you will finally incidentally you have a lot of patients that have a abdominal CT and they, oh, this patient has a fatty liver uh, seen on the CT or the ultrasound. Um, usually you want, uh, you want to do a six month screen for hepato, uh, cellular carcinoma for uh, masses. And then the uh, liver biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosing cirrhosis. Uh, so when you get a biopsy, uh, so we uh, here we have a normal liver, the portal triad would be the hepatic artery, the uh, portal vein, and the um, bile duct. Here we have a healthy one with no fibrosis. We have abnormal liver tissue here, uh, seen with fibrosis, uh, the macronodules, uh, macronodules and micronodules that lead up to the regenerative nodules. And then Another thing that I forgot to talk about whenever I, uh, that's the other thing I forgot to talk about whenever I was talking about alcoholic uh, hepatitis is uh, you get a cynophilic infiltration of hepatocytes because um, the alcohol and the metabolism of it or the breakdown leads to those reactive um, oxygen species which then interact with the cell membranes and causes inflammation, macromolecules, uh, that signals, you know, to to the immune system and neutrophils, you know, uh, come in the cell, and uh, so we get uh, the mallory bodies, which just clumps of eosinophils. Uh, you know, there's really no treatment for cirrhosis other than transplant. Uh, what we really want to treat is the hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, viral hepatitis. Uh, steatosis, uh, stea hepatitis, what's causing, what can cause the cirrhosis. Other than that, we're just really uh, treating the uh, side effects of the cirrhosis or the complications of cirrhosis. Um, so we're antiviral drugs, uh, abstain from alcohol or drugs, and you know, educate the patient on um, better diet or exercise and diet. Uh, Varices. Um, patients with bleeding varices, we have that in the hospital a lot. They come in, throw in up blood, they have a history of cirrhosis. Then we have to get the 
GI involves and they can have endoscopy and likely ligation of the varices. Uh, sometimes we start them on uh, somatostatin uh, drip, which is controversial. It's supposed to help with the portal vein hypertension. I don't know. You'll see a lot. We want to be practicing evidence-based medicine, but when you're out and you're out, that, that's the beauty of being a, a student is uh, you get to out, you be out, and you get to be with I don't know, 10 different preceptors. And then uh, you get to see each style and which style you want to pick up or or sometimes which style you don't want to pick up. And uh, medicine is so unique, you might, uh, you might see five different providers and they might all do different things. Uh, one good example is uh, a sore throat. You might go see somebody for a sore throat, somebody might just look at it and say, that's virus. Yeah. Because 90% is viral, you know? Uh, go home, take some Tylenol. You might see somebody else that swabs it. You might be somebody else that just treats it. You know, so uh, a lot of patients, like, they try to find fault, you know? Like, oh, I went to this doctor and he didn't do anything for me, but then I saw another doctor and he did something. Sometimes you're doing more harm by treating it, you know? Uh, so just keep that in mind about, uh, and then like I said, you want to do evidence-based medicine, but sometimes uh, culture sticks around. Uh, culture is typically what patient, people do just because that's what they've been doing for a while. And at some point, probably that culture was evidence-based medicine, you know, but now we have no evidence-based medicine. And it goes back to the point that if you constantly don't have feedback or, you know, interaction with people that are up to date, maybe you'll be doing a lot of culture, you know. And then variceal bleeding, we talked about the variceal bleeding, and then the ascites. Um, you just have to be careful when you put these patients on Lasix and spinolactone to now make sure that they, their renal function has to be monitored. Uh, and, and stress the importance to them of weighing themselves every day. Hey, weigh yourself every day. If you, if you gain more than three pounds, give me a call or give your hep hepatologist a call so they can increase your uh, medication, but uh, make sure they keep an eye on the renal function. Or if you lose more than three pounds from baseline, you know, you might want to hold off to your diuretics and talk to your doctor. That way you don't have a more uh, acute kidney injury. Um, because that really, for volume, that's the only way we can uh, really monitor patients for volume at home. And volume is so, like, that's one of, um, in the hospital, as a hospitalist, you better know the volume status of every patient. You know, is this patient hypovolemic, euvolemic, or hypervolemic? You better know because all your treatment is based on that. If I'm not going to give this patient, am I going to give this patient IV fluids and they already have congested heart failure and volume overloaded? Am I going to send them into pulmonary edema? Like when you do a hospital rotation, make sure you always check for the volume status. Or uh, why one one very important one is hyponatremia. You know, patients with cirrhosis they have hyponatremia, but it's not because their volume is good. It's because they actually have the opposite problem. So don't be that PA that, you know, go sees a patient who has hyponatremia and start on IV fluids uh, when they have cirrhosis and they clearly have edema, uh, bipasal crackle, ascites. It's like, that's just going to make you look like an idiot. And, and one other thing besides looking like an idiot is just going to, the patient outcome is going to be worse because they might end up intubated in the ICU. You know, so volume status is so, so important. Um, uh, so just make sure you guys review your... The, the hyponatremia was one of those things that I had a really hard time wrapping my head around, and maybe barely now I'm getting used to it. Um, but, you know, it, it is really truly important to know the volume status. And if a patient says, oh, by the way, I've been throwing up, it has a gastroenteritis, uh, throwing up, and I have diarrhea, and, and then you go see them on physical exam, they have sunken eyes, they have skin tinting, they have dry mucous membranes, and they have a hyponatremia of one, you know, 29. You can be pretty sure this patient's hyponatremia is likely from uh, volume loss and not from. Uh, another thing I always ask my patients too, if they have hyponatremia, hey, have you ever been told you have congestive heart failure? Have you ever been told you have um, kidney disease or um, liver disease? You know, um, because then if they say yes and on physical exam they have edema, uh, then likely it's from volume overload, and you don't need to be given enough fluids. You know, more. You need to do the opposite. You need to free water, restrict them, and maybe some diuretics. Um, so um, just keep that in mind when just the hyponatremia. 
Uh, we talked about the hepatorenal syndrome. Uh, like I said, just be careful with the diuretics because you might want to, you might make, be making them feel better initially, uh, you know, helping them with their edema and their ascites, but eventually you're going to cause enough renal failure uh, that uh, they're going to be feeling crappy again. And make sure that when you start somebody in diuretics, uh, that you're monitoring their renal function. You know, especially if you're given IV for renal function and electrolytes. Uh, and then we talked about the hepatic encephalopathy, uh, the lactulose, easy, it's easy to treat them, the hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, the, the hard part, initially, if you don't know this patient has cirrhosis, when they have, if they just present to the ER, uh, they're confused, uh, making the diagnosis of hepatic cirrhosis. So all these other findings on physical exam might lead you to that diagnosis. Uh, not, you know, it's nice whenever you have a patient that can tell you history and you have family at bedside, but like for example, I had the other day, we had a patient that was dropped off in front of the ER and she was high on meth. I couldn't get any history from her, you know, so. Uh, you don't get the, or the patient that's dementic, that's at the nursing home, that that family never visits, they show up, you, you know, you might, you might get a medication list, you know. Uh, if you work in the ER, probably not, you know. Uh, we might get a medication list two or three days later. Or if you might call the pharmacy. Uh, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, this is uh, sometimes, this is from the ascites just sitting in the peritoneal cavity and, you know, bacteria getting into it. Uh, there's some controversy, controversy about doing paracentesis uh, in patients that have ascites because uh, you can actually uh, infect that food and give them spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So, uh, you always have to bet the benefit, the benefit versus the risk, you know, why, some patients want to know why, oh, why didn't I have a paracentesis? Every time I come to the, per to the hospital, I get a paracentesis, you know. Well, you know, yes and no, we might make things worse, you know, it's that benefit versus risk. I've actually never uh, transfused pa uh, patients uh, for a little platelet, but if they're going for surgery or if, if keep this in the back of your mind, when a patient is going for paracentesis, surgery, uh, thoracentesis, uh, make sure you always get an iron arm or make sure you always look at the platelets. Make sure they're off blood thinners. Uh, you know, if a patient's plated at seven and they need a thoracentesis, a diagnostic uh, a thoracentesis, we, we have a lot of patients. The slides don't, I don't think I saw anything talk about uh, hepatic uh, pulmonary syndrome or. Uh, or uh, hydro uh, hepatic hydrothorax. That's when there's translocation of the ascites into the lung. Well, sometimes when you have a unilateral pleural effusion, it has to be worked up. You know, unless you have a young trait that you can uh, say justify and say, oh, this patient has an young trait and they have a pleural effusion. Likely, the pleural effusion is from the um, pneumonia. Well, make sure you treat the pneumonia and you get a chest X-ray seven to ten days later to make sure that pleural effusion. But a, a unilateral pleural effusion is malignancy unless proven otherwise. So they have to have pleural effusion. We have a lot of patients that have cirrhosis that have unilateral pleural effusion that do need a, a, a diagnostic. And sometimes, once you do a diagnostic, that's therapeutic. So um, make sure they're, you know, that their platelets and their coagulation studies and they're not on blood thinners to, to get that study. Uh, just always, that's just one of the things when. Like I said, the things that make you a good clinician when you see a unilateral pleural effusion reflexively, not even like, it's like taking a breath, you should be thinking, does this patient need a thoracentesis? Do I have a misconnection for this pleural effusion? Um, uh, and then eventually when, when, now that we're talking about hepatic pulmonary syndrome, eventually when their cirrhosis gets so bad, um, so, you know, this is a, a alveoli and this is, you know, the blood. So here comes the oxygen, right? Uh, there's blood going through here. Well, there's uh, there's chemicals or hormones or etc. being released, uh, cytokines being released by the the liver that cause vasodilation, just like it caused vasodilation in the kidney to help it perfuse. It affects the kidney, the the lung. So now you have a bigger area where the oxygen has to diffuse. So if you, this patient might be hypoxic, you know? It's, what is it, Boyle's Law, the pressure, you know, the air, and so much. This, this oxygen can only diffuse so fast. 
you know. If you have to diffuse it all the way over here, that's why this patient might become hypoxic. Um, and then, uh, this is probably, you know, patients that have, they just keep in mind that patients that have a long cirrhosis for a long time, maybe the hepatosteroid carcinoma. In my setting, I usually don't screen because, uh, for uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma, that's probably in the outpatient setting by the hepatologist. Uh, we deal more with the acute complications of cirrhosis. Uh, but just keep in mind, uh, if a patient comes in with cirrhosis, uh, you, you should always be aware of the potential for uh, cancer, you know. Uh, and uh, things like, oh, well, could this patient cirrhosis advance to hepatocellular carcinoma and now they have a blood clot? You know, they show up with a blood clot. Uh, malignancy is a big uh, risk factor for uh, uh, for PEs or DVTs. You know, this is where you get paid the big bucks to make the connections between disease processes and uh, risk factors. And you might this patient might have a blood clot, and you might have no clue why. There's always a reason, you know. So it's just random. Not not to say that every patient has a hepatocellular carcinoma has a blood clot. Just you know. This is how people end up with diagnoses. Is they just have random events happen to them, and then you, as a great PA and great clinician, you put it all together, right? Mm -hmm. and, like, and then you walk around with your white coat like a badass. <laughs> <laughs> like I saw what the, what was it? Uh, the PA that diagnosed that lady that had the bleeding of her nose uh, yeah. because she had the crack. It was arterial spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be pretty excited about it. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, like I said, this is probably more outpatient screening mm -hmm. with a patient has cirrhosis, just screening for esophageal varices because inevitably they're going to bleed and um, it's good to have documentation uh, of if that way it helps out if the patient just shows up bleeding. And then we talked about uh, uh, paracentesis, uh, usually, um, usually we do it more for uh, therapeutic versus diagnostic. Sometimes we do it for diagnostic if the patient comes in with a fever and a leukocytosis, you know, and you want to know where the uh, infection is. So you do a paracentesis and you know that they have ascites on physical exam, so it could be a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Uh, and then this is, uh, uh, for me, it's more of asking the patient, hey, are you on the liver transplant? Have you been evaluated by the transplant team in my sitting? Or are you not a candidate for liver transplant because you keep smoking and keep drinking alcohol? Uh, am I ready to talk to the patient about hospice? Because if they don't get a liver transplant, there is no cure for cirrhosis. So uh, I put a lot of patients on hospice. You know, you have to, in my setting, in the hospitalists we see in the end-stage diseases, you have to get comfortable talking to patients about, hey, your mom, you know, unfortunately, no matter what we do, she's not going to get better. Do you want us to prolong her suffering? You know, that's pretty much what you're doing with patients, you know. Uh, patients have, they go into cardiac arrest, you give them CPR, you're cracking the ribs, putting a throat down their tube, that's painful, you know. Patient might come back and their quality of life is not any good, why? You know, for what? The patient's just going to keep having cirrhosis, no cure, you know. So it, sometimes it's hard to have that conversation with family, and it might sound harsh, but you know, hey, at some point you gotta be like, listen, I don't know if anybody's told you the severity of the disease and the poor prognosis, and listen, I don't know if anybody's told you, but there's no, you can see the best uh, hepatologist in Harvard or the Mayo Clinic, and they're still not gonna be able to fix you. Like, well, what's more important, to keep living like this, or do you wanna just be, you know? So this is another com conversation you have to get comfortable with. And then the MEL score, you know, they predict like mortality rates, morbidity, mortality, uses INR, um, you know, you can look it up. Uh, I, I don't know what a, what a, well, I shouldn't say that. I know what a stable cirrhosis patient, we have plenty of cirrhosis patients that are stable. Uh, but this is more probably for the hepatologist when they follow up seeing them. I kind of wanted to talk more about the complications of cirrhosis and why you have these complications of cirrhosis and so you can have an idea, a concept of uh, how, how to treat it and 
what to be looking for, so that way you never forget uh, some basic physiology, biochemistry, uh, versus a lot of uh, treatment or maintenance care. Uh, here we have diet modifications. Uh, this is where, uh, you know, it's scary to think, because uh, I see a lot of the compensated cirrhosis. Uh, their mortality rate is pretty high. You know, and patients, sometimes when you talk about morbidity and mortality, patients want to know uh, what, how long do I have to live. Sometimes it's hard to tell, you know. Um, but you always want to talk about the one year and the five year. So make sure you look at the one year. Uh, you know, you, we've had a patient that somebody swore they would die within hours and they stayed, they stayed alive. And then what do you tell the family? So don't ever tell patients or family that they're going to pass away unless you're unless they're like on 30 liters of oxygen and you know that if you put lost the oxygen because they have pulmonary fibrosis, they're probably going to pass in an hour or two. Other than that, I wouldn't, you know, I'd probably be like, only the God, uh, if there's no, because it, uh, it's an uncomfortable situation I have with the family when you told them they're going to die in an hour and the patient's still alive. So. So here we have some, uh, uh, the most important thing about this slide is it does, if you end up working in a setting where you can prevent cirrhosis, this is why. This is why we want to prevent it because there is no cure for cirrhosis other than transplantation and transplantation is a long process. Like patients be on the list forever or they might not qualify. So if you can help somebody with diabetes, uh, prevent having them from fatty liver, you know, this is why we treat patients for, we don't do enough in the United States to prevent diseases or progression of diseases. We wait until they have cirrhosis. We could have controlled their diabetes. We could have had a good, we don't do a good enough job educating patients. Hey, you know what? Uh, your diabetes could lead you to cirrhosis. You know, I'm not saying you're gonna have cirrhosis or your diabetes is a risk factor for you having a heart attack or a stroke. You know, this is why you, you might get to, you know, and I, and I go through this sometimes where I get, to the stage where I'm like, oh, why, like, why, why am I even wasting my time with this patient, you know? But there is value to talking to your patients, to telling them, you know, the patients are like, I don't have diabetes, like, I just have whatever, why do I need to be treated, you know? Like, this is why, you want to prevent those end-stage diseases, so. Any uh, questions that you guys have? You're probably all hungry, don't care about cirrhosis. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my name is uh, Sergio Porras, and it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm sorry if I repeat myself a lot. I know I repeat myself a lot, but I, uh, I don't know if the, Dr. Donahue comes uh, down here to lecture. Uh, uh, repetition is the mother of all learning, so uh, sorry if I know you. <laughs>